Today we're going to be reviewing the Mazda CX-5. Now most car journalists would argue that the CX-5 is one of the best affordable SUVs that you could take on the track. We're going to be taking a look under the hood and underneath this vehicle to see just what it takes to make it so engaging and fun to drive. And we're going to start under the hood where underneath this plastic cover we have Mazda's 2.5 liter inline four cylinder engine and it's situated slightly on the passenger side transversely for front wheel drive. And just underneath that battery on the driver's side we have a six speed automatic transmission. That's right there's no CV VTs, dual clutch transmissions, turbochargers or hybrid systems to worry about. Everything is plain and simple under the hood of the Mazda. Taking a look at how things are laid out under the hood here, on the front side we've got the air intake and on the back side there we have the exhaust. Over the side here we have the battery, the ECU, the fuse box and the air box. At the front here we have the coolant jug and on this side we have the windshield washer reservoir and the ABS module. Now starting with the air intake system we have fresh air drawn in from the front of the vehicle here. It's then going to go down into the air reservoir box and then back up into this air box where it's going to get filtered out. It'll then pass by the mass airflow sensor, this drive-by wire throttle body, and then into this plastic intake plenum before it goes down into the engine head. Now the competition should definitely take note. You just have to remove two clips here and then you can pop this air box off and easily access that air filter. This one's a little dirty. I haven't even started this video yet and I've hit my head so many times just leaning into the engine bay. This hood sits way too low if you want to do any kind of work on the CX-5. So here's what the air box assembly looks like once it's removed. You can see it's a pretty big unit but it pops up just all in one piece and it sits on these little rubber bushings here. This part acts like a resonator box. Now with the air box removed you can see you've got clear access to that drive-by wire throttle body inside of there. Now further down on the intake here we have this manifold absolute pressure sensor so that's also an addition to the map sensor. Taking a look at the fuel system on the CX-5, now this is a direct injection engine only. There is no port injection, otherwise you would have port injectors at the top here. Now the low pressure pump in the tank is going to bring fuel to this high pressure fuel pump to this line over here. Now this high pressure fuel pump is actually driven off of the exhaust camshaft and that's going to pressurize the fuel to a really high pressure and then send it down the fuel line down here underneath this intake plenum so it gets directly injected into the cylinder. Now looking on the passenger side of the vehicle, you can see this is the fuel rail and its pressure sensor located over here so the rail is going to run the length here and have four individual injectors. Now because this engine is only direct injection and there's no port injection to clean the intake valves at some point you might have to remove this in order to clean those valves manually because you could have carbon building up causing an issue. Now just behind the rear left wheel we've got a peek at the fuel system you can see that this is the gas tank over here it is a stamped steel gas tank and there's two parts one over on this side and one over on this side over here. Now underneath the left side carpeting just in front of the fuel tank is where the EVAP canister is located. Taking a look across the top of the engine here we have a plastic valve cover. We've got the oil filler cap here. Luckily this takes 0W20 weight oil. We've also got the oil dipstick straight over here and these four ignition coils that are really easy to access when you need to change your spark plug. Now the back here we have the purge valve for the EVAP system that's got a line that goes down to the intake and we've got this other ventilating tube from the valve cover to the intake. Taking a look under the CX-5 you can see that things here are fairly flat and covered with the exception of the rest of the exhaust going all the way back. Now that's good for aerodynamics and it's also good to prevent salt water from splashing up and corroding components above. Now the downside to that is you have to remove this access panel in order to get to your oil filter and drain plug. But at least it's just like one bolt. It's not like you have to remove the whole panel. Volkswagen. Now with that cover removed you can see you've got clear access to the engine on this side here and the transmission underneath the vehicle. Now taking a look underneath the engine here we've got this oil pan here. Now this oil pan is pretty easy to access should you need to drop it out. Now, underneath that we have this oil level sensor here to tell the computer how much oil you've got left. We've also got this oil filter which is a canister style oil filter and the drain plug easily located over here. I wonder if you open this drain plug if the oil is going to splash on this filter. Pew. Now looking up underneath the intake next to the starter here is the PCV system. Now this is an oil separator it's going to separate any oil from the crankcase side of the engine and let that drop back down to the oil pan and then the remaining vapors can go back into the intake system to be burned. Now the reason why this oil pan is so deep is because the timing chain actually runs inside of here to power the oil pump and the balance shaft. Now further up inside of here where all these wires are there's an oil control valve that controls that oil pump electronically. Now taking a look on the passenger side of the vehicle underneath this cover here we have a timing chain which is good because you don't need to replace it over the life of the vehicle. Now underneath this cover we have an electric motor that actually actuates the variable valve timing. That means that the motor is going to either advance or retard the phase of the camshaft relative to the timing chain. Now on the exhaust side we have variable valve timing but it's the more traditional oil control hydraulic style and its oil control valve is located over here. Now just in front of that timing chain is the drive belt setup. Now at the top here you can see you've got clear access to look at the alternator and its drive belt over here and further down inside of there we have the tensioner but accessing this area is pretty difficult from the top so if you got to change the belt to service anything here it's best done from the bottom. The water 
water pump has its own belt that runs off of the crankshaft and it's located near the back of the engine over here. Now looking from below here you can see we've got the AC compressor and further up there is the alternator. Now to remove the AC compressor is pretty easy just four bolts and of course it's lined but you will have to drain the AC system to remove the AC compressor in order to get the alternator out because that drops out the bottom. And now we're going to have a listen to the startup sound. Now generally speaking under the hood of the CX-5, just like any modern vehicle, it's got its fair share of sensors and computers and wires. You can see that the ECU is located over here just in front of the battery. Now, I don't typically like that because all you've got is the airbox sitting here preventing it from getting crushed in a collision. I would have preferred that these ECUs were actually inside the vehicle away from any heat or the elements. Now pushed further to the back here is the battery which is probably better for weight distribution. And then over here we have the fuse box which is nicely labeled and very easy to access. Taking a look at the transmission on the CX-5, Mazda's chosen a very simple method with just a 6-speed automatic transmission. Most other automakers are offering CVTs or even an 8-speed automatic transmission. Now the top of this transmission here we have a shift linkage. There's no electronic shift or a motor that changes your gears for you like on a Ford or something. We've got this wire here that goes to the valve body and down inside of here we have the transmission cooler and these are the coolant lines that go to it. So instead of bringing ATF out of the transmission into the radiator for example, it's all self-contained inside of there which is less prone to leak. Now, you guys really wouldn't believe what's underneath this orange thing. Now with that bolt removed, if I pull on this orange thing, check it out. It's actually a dipstick. When was the last time you've seen a transmission dipstick on a modern day vehicle? Now that means you can actually check your transmission fluid the old school way with just a dipstick and not have to fill it up and guess how much you've put in or you know check your operating temperature or use any fancy scan tools. Just a simple old dipstick. And you actually fill the transmission fluid from there which is pretty easy to access once you remove the air box. Now taking a look under the transmission looks like an older style vehicle because it actually has a pan. Modern vehicles don't really have a pan. It's just kind of split down the casing like this with a drain plug. The drain plug is located over here and the valve body is underneath this pan. Again, modern vehicles house it somewhere up near the front. It almost seems like Mazda's included a jack point for the engine and transmission over here. Now further up from the transmission pan, here's another look at the transmission cooler. And then further up from that, we have the starter. Now the starter is pretty easy to access. It's just two bolts and it comes right out. Now once the transmission is done changing the gear ratio, it's going to send that power over to this front differential over here. Now this is an all wheel drive model, so that's going to send it to the front wheels, but some of that power is going to be split over here to this transfer case. Now the transfer case is going to take rotational energy and translate it 90 degrees to the drive shaft coming out the back here for the rear wheel. Servicing the transfer case is pretty straightforward. You have a fill plug at the top here and a drain plug down below here. Now that drive shaft is going to send power to this rear differential which is going to send it out to the rear wheels. Now just because Mazda says it's got G vectoring control that doesn't mean that this is actually a torque vectoring differential. Now taking a look at that differential we've got the fill port and the drain ports located over here. Now just in front of that differential is a clutch pack which controls the all-wheel drive system through this little wire over here. So that's what's going to engage and disengage this rear differential. Now the rear differential and the axles are pretty small in diameter so you can definitely tell that most of the power is going to be sent up front Front. and if anything barely maybe 50% of the power will be sent out the back and that's only going to be momentary just to help you over that speed bump at your local beach parking lot. Now taking a look at things from underneath, you can see that Mazda still uses a plastic radiator support, but they're nice enough to still put this reinforcement bar in. I don't think you could jack your car up on it though. Now Mazdas were typically known for their rusting issues, and I'm very shocked that even a year old vehicle has rusted so much. You can see even on the covered areas here, there's still some surface rust. There's a rust over here on the subframe, and even on the control arms and near the bushings. Time is only going to tell before this whole thing rots through like the old Mazdas. Now the front suspension on the CX-5 is just the McPherson struts style suspension that's bolted onto a cast steel knuckle. Even the lower control arm is a stamped steel material. Here we've got the inner and outer tie rods as well as the stabilizer link as it joins to the stabilizer bar going over to the other side. Now where the stabilizer link joins at the strut you've got these two weird rubber isolators and that's there to prevent any resonance from traveling into the cabin. Now it's hard to miss the rust that's forming in the suspension and the subframe members. Now looking from the back of the front suspension here you can see that the bearings are a bolted on style bearing with a steel steering knuckle. Now the ball joint is not replaceable in the control arm but it does use a pinch bolt style design so good luck getting that out when it rusts in there. Now although the CX-5 does handle well it uses a McPherson strut suspension so it's not going to handle as well as a vehicle with double wishbone suspension for example. Now overall I'm pretty disappointed that there's a lack of use of aluminum in the suspension setup to lighten things up and to help prevent some of this corrosion. Now the rear suspension on the CX-5 is a bit of a miss bag. Of course you have a multi-link suspension which is standard for this class however come down later in the road you're going to have to replace some of these components and some of these links are not the easiest to replace. For example, if we take this forged upper control arm for instance, now if you happen to hit a curb or something, this is going to be the first piece that's going to bend and that's going to affect your camber. 
However, to replace that, you've got to drop down the whole subframe, which means you've got to disconnect driveline, exhaust, differential, and a bunch of other fuel components that are in the way to get at that bolt that's up inside of there. Some of the other components in the system include, and some of the other components in the suspension include this coil spring. We have this lower bed pan style control arm here. We have this shock absorber, which luckily has its bolts right at the top here, so you can access that from outside. We've got the upper control arm over here. Down inside of there, we have the lateral link, and we've got the drive shaft, and then here we have the trailing arm. Now it's weird how they've included this cover to cover the ends on the subframe on this side, but just left the back side completely open. Now looking at the back here, we've got the stabilizer bar link and the sway bar that goes up over the subframe to the other side. So you gotta drop the subframe if you wanted to do a sway bar upgrade. Now looking at the suspension from underneath, this front control arm does have a little splash guard on it. And the subframe here is a stamped steel material. Now taking a look at the knuckle, it is a cast steel as you can tell by the rust. And at the top here, luckily at the back, you've got a bolt-on style ball joint. So you don't need a press to press out that bearing. Now we're gonna take a look at the cooling system on the CX-5. It starts here at the radiator cap. There's just a single one of these with a single tank over here. We've also got this upper radiator hose here that's gonna bring hot coolant out of the engine. Taking a look at the back of the radiator, we have two electric radiator fans here. Now these do turn on even after you turned off your car and locked it and walked away. That's just to help keep things cool. Looking further down below that, we've got the lower radiator hose here that runs alongside this upper radiator hose into this coolant junction over here. Now that coolant junction is going to join the upper and lower radiator hoses on this side, the heater core hoses from the back of the engine, as well as a bypass tube from the water pump all into this junction over here. And instead of having a thermostat inside, it's actually an electronic controlled valve that's going to control the flow of coolant based on engine temperature. Now this housing is made of plastic and I know some other automakers have struggled with plastic thermostat housings so time will tell to see how long this is going to hold up. Now looking up from underneath we've got the passenger CV axle here just above that we've got the water pump and the water pump has this bypass hose over here that's going to take coolant over to the other side to the junction box. We've also got this coolant temperature sensor over here. Now taking a look from underneath this here is the water pump and the crank pulley. Now there is no tension around here which means that the manual actually suggests that you stuff your brother's sock or any other rag underneath here turn the crank pulley and that cloth is going to allow this belt to peel off and peel on there's no tension or holding it on now to further aid with aerodynamics and cooling the lower half grille on the cx5 has an active grill shutter so inside of here these flaps are going to open and close with an electronic motor depending on the cooling requirement of the vehicle now i always found the front end design on these mazas to be really awkward with how much it sticks out compared to where the radiator is it makes it kind of awkward when you have to bend over and work on your vehicle it's pretty hard on your back i guess the only upside to this is that you don't have to to remove this entire front bumper assembly if you need to change the radiator it just slides straight up here now i'm not sure why maz has gone through the trouble of making a second panel just for the stickers when it just reveals more plastic down below and here's a look at those two radiator fans from underneath now i'm actually surprised that there's quite a lot of room between the radiator fans and the engine most modern vehicles kind of shoves things straight up to there because there's not enough room in the engine bay now the CX-5 has three engine mounts. The first one is on the passenger side over here, mounted to the frame rail nice and high near the top of the engine. It's got some squishy rubber, so this is probably a hydraulic bushing. The second one over here is on the transmission side on the frame rail, mounted a little bit further down below under the battery. Now the third engine mount is located between the engine and the transmission over here and it attaches to the rear subframe. Now this is just a torque mount and it prevents the whole engine from rocking back and forth under acceleration. Now taking a look at the exhaust system on the CX-5, now this one does not have a turbocharger and you can see the exhaust manifold is just a steel unit underneath this heat shield here. It's not integrated into the head. Now this manifold is interesting because it doesn't go straight down to the flex pipe down below. It actually forces the exhaust gas to swirl around in a spiral and integrates the catalytic converter and then it goes down to the flex plate. Here's a look at that big bowl of the exhaust manifold coming out from underneath. Taking a look at this diagram, you can see the unequal lengths that this big spiral ball shape forms as the exhaust manifold molds itself into the catalytic converter. Now the reason Maz has done this is because if you had equal length runners, the exhaust pulses would travel into the other cylinders. So to reduce engine knock, you make the headers longer so that by the time the pulse reaches back to the cylinder, the exhaust valve is already closed. Now that exhaust is going to continue from the flex pipe out to another two-way catalytic converter and then to a mid silencer and then out to the back. Now the exhaust is then going to come from that mid silencer over to this valve over here. Now this valve is just a little flap that's going to vary the flow characteristics of the exhaust when your cylinder deactivation is enabled just so that you don't hear the unpleasant sound of only two cylinders firing away. Now once the exhaust made it past that flap it's then going to cross the rear differential and then into a center inlet rear muffler. Now that exhaust is then going to split over to the left and the right side. Now luckily Mazda does not give you any fake exhaust tips you actually get real cutouts on the bumper. And now we'll have a listen to the exhaust. Thank you. 
Now taking a look at the braking system on the CX-5, it uses a traditional style master cylinder with a vacuum brake booster at the back there. Now if you follow that vacuum line off the brake booster, it actually goes to a vacuum pump and that's because these Skyactiv engines don't have enough vacuum inside of the intake manifold to generate enough pressure for that vacuum booster. Now it also forms part of the housing for the direct injection pump, so these are all kind of powered off of that exhaust camshaft. Now on almost all new cars, the brake lines are going to run from the master cylinder over to the ABS module, usually situated in a very nice nice safe spot on this side of the vehicle, but Mazda has chosen to run all those lines back out to this side to the ABS module, which is going to control the traction, stability, and any autonomous braking features on this vehicle. Now speaking of autonomous braking feature, the radar sensor for your distance measurement is actually behind the emblem. Now I personally never liked this style of emblem because it just looked like a flat sticker, but then when you realize the radar sensor is buried under here, it's actually a smarter idea than putting it further down on the bumper like some other automakers do. Besides, most of this grill isn't really used for airflow anyways, you can see that the air holes here are just on the bottom part. All the top part here is just a solid piece of plastic. Now taking a look at the front brakes on the CX-5, this is just a single piston floating caliper design with a disc. Now there are dual piston designs that are available and that would make a nice bolt-on upgrade for this car. Now the rear brake setup on the CX-5 consists of a single caliper on a solid disc rotor. Now with only 37,000 kilometers, I'm actually quite surprised that this rotor is pretty scored up and might need to be replaced soon. Now because this is a modern vehicle, it does use an electric parking brake, which means you've got this actuator over here. It's gonna squeeze the pad together again this rotor to stop this wheel. Now the power steering system on the CX-5 uses this electric motor that's mounted on the steering column underneath the dashboard away from any element. I don't know if you've ever noticed why your gas pedal clicks when you hit 100% throttle but it's actually there as a tactile feedback to the driver warning them that you've actually hit 100% throttle and you're not just sleeping away at the wheel or something. There is no electronic button or kick down function that happens when you hit that. Now overall I think Mazda's done a pretty good job in terms of build quality and some of the material choices especially in the interior here where there's enough technology to fool you into thinking this is a really good SUV. However under the hood I think that's where Mazda's taking more of a traditional tried and true approach by using older technology such as a naturally aspirated engine and a six-speed automatic transmission. A lot of its competitors have a lot more technology under the hood at this price point however I think this is going to work well if you want to keep this vehicle for a long term because its simplicity lends to its reliability and that's a wrap on the mechanicals of the Mazda CX-5 now you tell me in the comment section down below if you think this is just an old car and a new skin or if this is actually worth buying for long term make sure you subscribe to see more videos just like this one uh -oh.